uh, of LibreTex. And I, I think this is an interesting presentation to sort of we're at the tail end of um, the OER Faculty Institute. Oops, cancel. Okay. And um, uh, what's been interesting for me is to, we've been listening to uh, people talk about um, building OER in community, um, building OER solo, um, moving to different platforms, all of the time that they put them in. Somebody who's, who's done that uh, from the beginning is Delmar Larson. Uh, I don't even want to think about how far back Ken Wiki is. It seems like, it seems like a long time ago, but um, maybe he'll, he'll tell us something of that. Um, Delmar Larson is uh, presenting on Libra texts, which is a OER platform the past, present, and future. And Delmar, if you'd like to take it away. Great, thank you very much. Uh, let me get my screen going. Can everyone see and hear me? Yes. We okay, can. great. I always wanna make sure because lots of mistakes have happened. So let me get things started. Um, so, <clears throat> It's a pleasure to virtually be here. Uh, I am speaking from the Central Valley of California right now, but I'll be talking a bit about the past uh, that does actually overlap a bit in your guys' region here. So um, in this general discussion, um, and actually all discussions that I give in OER, I like to emphasize why we do what we do. Uh, and the key driving force that we have is this statement uh, that students are not a market to be financially exploited. That right there is a, a central theme associated with uh, the way we operate and the way that uh, we, meaning not just me, but the rest of the development team that puts in place here. So we're a very student-focused uh, project. That's our driving force. Um, but before getting into the finer details of how we address that, I want to talk about uh, who I am, uh, which makes, uh, which is intimately connected with what we do in a variety of things. So I'm a professor of chemistry at the University of California, Davis. I've been here since 2005. Uh, my research focuses on ultra-fast laser spectroscopies of photoactive biological systems, which means I have a bunch of lasers that shoot laser pulses into biological things, typically proteins, and I look at what they do there. Um, most of you are probably not overly excited about that right now or more interested in the OER effort that we've been doing. Uh, I'm the founder and director of the LibreTex project. It was established as the Chem Wiki, as mentioned before, back in 2008. So it was 15 years ago. So that makes us a somewhat mature OER uh, denizen. Um, I am the founder and the primary sponsor uh, of the uh, UC Davis Aggie Open program, which is the OER program on my campus. Uh, but more importantly, I'm an adopter of OER, I'm an adapter of OER, I'm a creator of OER, and I'm a curator of OER. So basically, I'm a practitioner of OER um, at every single level associated with that. And that uh, practitioner-oriented perspective uh, underlies the whole organization of the LibreTex project and how we actually implement it. In fact, you're not going to find any other organization out there that, or any other platform that both gives you the technology and actually it knows about using it in the classroom because we do. And I've been using OER uh, for about to about 5,000 or so students over those 15 years. Uh, <clears throat> so where do I come from? Uh, well, I was born about 50 years ago uh, in Anchorage, Alaska. I was not born in a sink. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I was cute. I don't know what happened to me, uh, but things changed. Uh, I had a reasonable childhood playing around. I spent a little bit of time in the Midwest. Uh, in the Midwest, I did what Midwest uh, boys did, which was play in fields and do other things when I was out there. So things were fine and dandy. Uh, uh, but uh, things started to go awry uh, near the end of my primary education. Uh, and it turned out that things changed quite radically. Um, so while I was born in Anchorage and spent time in the Midwest, uh, my formative years were in uh, Northern uh, Seattle, uh, actually specifically Linwood in the North End. <laughs> and that's important because this Denny's uh, on 196th Street Southwest uh, in Linwood, Washington. Uh, I spent a lot of time there. And the reason I did that was because of this truck, which was my father's truck, which is where I lived in the back of. 
Uh, so I spent multiple years homeless living in the back of a truck in a variety of places, not all behind the specific Denny's. Um, but the key point is that uh, I understood uh, at a visceral level uh, the, the needs associated with uh, education because education is what took me out of this level of poverty. Um, so I'm very strongly committed to the student-oriented goal of that because OER is a manifestation of being able to provide affordable education to get out of the situation. And while affordable education has become not as affordable as it used to be, um, uh, and textbook costs and other material costs is one of the principal components for the growing um, expanse uh, associated with uh, affordable education, I'm in a position in order to be able to address that. So when I became a faculty member, um, and I may mention, I also went to UW uh, and graduated in 95. Uh, I presume many of you guys have a similar um, background. Anyways, um, so as an instructor, when I uh, became a faculty member in uh, 2005 in Davis, California, it became clear to me that I was a critical component of an existing system uh, that was making textbook unaffordable for solutions, uh, uh, for students. And uh, I didn't feel I had to be that way. Um, so I wanted to be able to generate an infrastructure to take the position that I had uh, at a faculty, uh, as a then tenure track and now tenured position at R1 institution and use that as a mechanism in order to pursue my goals in order to address affordable education. Uh, now, while I would like to be able to address it from a tuition perspective, I don't have the power in order to be able to influence that. Um, however, I do have the power in order to influence what goes on in my classroom, thanks to academic freedom. Um, so that's where uh, our effort came in. So uh, for those of you that don't know me, uh, I tend to try to be an iconoclast in everything I do, which sometimes causes some troubles. I don't wanna just work within the system. Uh, I want to break the system um, because the system is broken, um, at least in terms of being able to address what we wanna be able to address in public education. <laughs> so <clears throat> in order to do that, I needed to build an infrastructure that gave me control. Uh, I needed the freedom to be able to pursue uh, uh, to, uh, sorry, make a, uh, an infrastructure that gave me freedom away from other uh, limiting factors like OER platforms, where I want to be able to control and, and expand beyond the limitations associated with them. Freedom from limited utility from a variety of different purposes, a uh, limited scope associated with different technologies. Um, I wanted to have the ability in order to share broadly. Um, and, and that required uh, building things largely in-house uh, or capitalizing on other open source technology. So getting into the details about why you're here, 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 uh, our mission statement uh, for the LibreTex project as a whole um, can be summarized in this short little sentence here. So we're implementing a community built platform for the construction, curation, adoption, and adaption of OER that can be is comprehensive and can be curated at multiple levels. Now, each of these words that's bolded is particularly important in order to define uh, what we're pursuing uh, in the Libre text. Each of the words that's in the parentheses is a more pragmatic, practical application of what we're trying to do, but they're all critical in order to be able to describe this thing. So this is actually quite a big mission um, that we're out here. So let me. Uh, rip it down a little bit uh, for you. So when we say community, we're basically saying that we're not making a one size fit all situation. We're not generating here is the book and either you adopt it or not. That's sort of like how OpenStax does it. We build an infrastructure that facilitates community involvement, community construction, community curation, community uh, contribution uh, into the infrastructure. Because as a community, we can move much uh, further and much faster than we can as an individual infrastructure. Um, OER, I'm going to say is free here. We can talk about what the definitions are uh, for OER uh, for a long period of time. I'm not going to be doing that. Comprehensive means that while I'm a chemistry professor, 
Uh, and uh, the Libra text was born out of the Chem Wiki, which was an open pedagogy project involving wikis and students. Uh, we've expanded to include a wide range of different fields. In fact, every academic field that OER can touch, we have an interest in order to be able to get involved in in some level or another. So we follow a no gap left behind policy as emerging gaps or holes in the landscape of OER becomes available, we want to be able to fill it or facilitate the filling of that. We also follow a no tech left behind policy. What that means is that as emerging technologies, let me phrase it, as emerging open source technologies become available, we will integrate it within our platform to provide an infrastructure that faculty can come in and use those technologies without having to learn about the details of implementing them or IT infrastructure on specific campuses. We fold them in in order to be able to make it so it's a powerful experience for faculty in order to be able to do this. Why do we do this? Well, because we are faculty. Uh, we know what we want, we know what we need, and we're pursuing that uh, as aggressively as we can. So we follow a no tech left behind policy in addition to no gap left behind policy. And lastly, our infrastructure is dynamic. That is, it has to be curatable. Uh, so we have to have an infrastructure that is designed, and I could talk about the finer details behind that, but it's designed in order to be able to make it so that individuals can curate the content because every content needs to be updated. Uh, moreover, content also needs to be localized or ideally could be localized. So if you build an infrastructure, build a textbook that targeted students in your local region, that provides a more engaging environment, let me phrase it, a more engaging textbook, and the students that are more engaged with the textbook learn more. And there are plenty of studies in order to be able to argue that. And that's what OER provides uh, us. And when this provide this is integrated into our DNA at level. The opposite of that would be for something like a, a collection of PDFs that are not, those PDFs are typically not curatable, they're not updatable, uh, and they're difficult in order to localize uh, and edit as necessary. And that is, again, a defining characteristic of how we operate. So um, let me lay down a, a couple terminologies, and then I'll get into the finer details behind uh, what we've done. Um, so these terms may have come up several times during this meeting so far, uh, and uh, when you're comparing and contrasting different platforms, they're useful in order to be able to have uh, this uh, integrated in order to be able to evaluate. So the first uh, three terms I want to talk about are referatory, repository, and platform. So referatory uh, is an infrastructure uh, that provides links to other sites. So content is stored somewhere else, and you provide links to that. Now, uh, <clears throat> Uh, that would be something along the lines of a library guide would be a referatory, but you can imagine you can scale it up massively uh, off of it. It's beneficial in that it's relatively easy in order to set up, I'm not saying it's trivial, um, but uh, because that you're not storing information, you're storing hyperlinks information, it's much easier in order to be able to implement. Uh, its detraction is that you're also at the mercy of external projects. So if you look at content on, if you do a link to some content somewhere else and that content goes away, then the actual integrity of the referatory starts to break down. We've been around the block long enough and the web has been around the block long enough in order for us to recognize the concept of link rot. Sites go up, sites go down. Lots of things have disappeared into the ether that they need to be recreated because they are uh, not centralized. A referatory is an infrastructure where you could take that content and keep it in a central place. Uh, and that provides the ability in order to avoid um, the uh, external linking issue. Link rot starts to go away because you have control over that. Uh, uh, it provides a mechanism in order to facilitate the distribution of content, but uh, it by itself doesn't necessarily have to be an editing platform. It can just store it. For example, a series of holding a bunch of PDFs is tantamount uh, to be in a repository uh, for distribution purposes off of there. They can either be dead, like a series of PDFs, or living where you have the ability to update. For example, Wikipedia is a repository that you can update off of it. OpenStax is a repository that you cannot update. And Pressbooks, if you actually pay for it, you have the ability to, to curate and update it, assuming you continually give them money in order to maintain it. Uh, so its benefits are stable. Its attraction is that uh, if you uh, if you don't uh, pay attention to the repository and you don't curate it centrally, it can actually age out. They can die. 
platforms and infrastructure, uh, referatory or, or actually typically connected repositories uh, that facilitates the creation of OER content. Uh, that means you basically have an editor in interface to the repository. So those are three definitions. What exactly is the Libreverse? The Libreverse is the technology that underlies the LibreText. That's what we've been constructing for a while, and that's what we've been distributing uh, out there. Uh, so the Libretext is the term we use for a greater project. The Libreverse is this ecosystem uh, that I'll be talking about in a moment. Um, so the Libreverse uh, is a referatory weekly. We have links outside to other parts of the infrastructure, but we want to avoid as many outside links as possible because we don't want to be link farmers. In other words, we don't want to curate links and make sure that we have all these links out there. So we integrate things into our infrastructure to be a massive repository. In fact, we're the largest central repository of OER content on the internet today. Um, I, let me phrase that, OER textbook content. Op op um, Wikipedia beats us uh, and probably will beat us for an extended period of time. Uh, we're an editing platform, so you can get an account and you can start to edit content. And that's not just libraries uh, or not just textbooks. You also have the ability to uh, edit and questions in our homework infrastructure and other technologies. Um, and uh, more importantly, from the student's perspective, it's a learning platform. So it's a mechanism or platform that students can use constructively. And then we have yeah. learning analytics infrastructure behind it in order to facilitate uh, understanding the evaluating the pedagogy and evaluating uh, efficacy of the resources that are created. Again, it's a very practitioner, comprehensive perspective that we're doing. Um, when I come to a term of describing what we are, I oftentimes use this term, which is entirely man-made, entirely made by me, that is. It, we're a curatory. So we host the content, we curate the content, but more importantly, uh, that really distinguishes us from other projects is that we're we're intimately connected with curating that content. Now, while we don't own that content, or at least not most of the content, uh, we take an ownership in order to be able to update that content and curate it as necessary. That means we facilitate bringing content in, we facilitate updating the content, we facilitate that either from a editing perspective or from an accessibility standard perspective and a lot of other things. We get our fingers dirty in terms of updating and maintaining our infrastructure. In other words, publishing is not the end game for us. Publishing is just the start of what's going on. And that reflects academia in that we're always constantly moving forward and cycling through. There is no end game uh, off of there. And that is where we go beyond other platforms out there because we take a strong commitment to actually maintaining what we're doing. Um, so, uh, to summarize, the Libreverse is a system of interconnected technologies developed with the goal of providing the practitioner a suite of tools to maximize the development, distribution, and usage of OER in the classroom. Again, um, not just the curatory is a defining characteristic of it. The other one is that we're very practitioner oriented because we are practitioners. So quickly, the Libreverse has three big themes off of that. One is as a construction platform, as I mentioned before. One is as a dissemination platform and one is the learning platform uh, that students can access. And individuals use different facets of the Libreverse depending upon their specific needs that's out there. So what does the Libreverse look, Lib, Libreverse look like? It looks something along the lines here in that we have 15 interconnected wiki libraries that are independently operating, focusing on specific fields. For example, chemistry is one of our biggest libraries because it was born out of the ChemWiki project. But we also have physics, we have social sciences, we have humanities, we have workforce, we even have a K-12 library. And we have two other ones that I can talk about if people are interested that, that focuses on OER and other languages. We have one in Spanish and one in Ukrainian. Uh, and the Ukrainian was uh, built in order to address the displaced students in the war uh, over in Europe. So the, the Libra versus architecture consists of these libraries that are interconnected. Um, and then we have these ancillary technologies around the library. So these act as the hub, the textbooks, and these are all the things that we need. The idea behind the Libraverse is to make a central infrastructure that's able to take the place of what commercial publishers provide you. And what do commercial publishers provide you? They provide you the homework system. They provide you the PowerPoint files. They provide you the homework infrastructure. They provide you other capabilities in order to facilitate that. It's a one-stop shopping adventure that publishers give you. And once you get pulled in, you get locked in. 
Uh, and the only way that we see in order to be able to remove that locking in is to provide the same capabilities outside of it. And that's what we've been pursuing. It's a big bite that we've taken here, um, but we've been doing this uh, for 15 years and I think we're successful. Hopefully you'll come to the same decision after this meeting. Um, so um, the other ancillary technologies includes our ADAPT homework system, which I'll be discussing uh, more later on. Um, the ability in order to embed questions into our textbooks. Uh, we have a Jupyter Notebook system, which gives us the ability to embed executable code. So if you want to build the textbook of the future, which is a textbook of technology, especially in the STEM fields, Jupyter Notebook systems provide that opportunity. So you can embed Python or R, Octave uh, uh, widgets and code directly into your textbook. We have a server for hosting JavaScripts for all those technologies I talked about before. We have a learning analytics infrastructure. We're currently updating it, but I'll show you a few snippets of that. We have a bot server that lets us do large scale curation efforts. For example, when accessibility issues come uh, uh, pop up or when changing accessibility standards happen, for example, WCAG accessibility uh, protocols uh, switch to 2.2 now, uh, um, and there's a few changes, not much uh, that's involved in that. We can use a bot to go through the, the textbook in order to address those things. Again, that's part of our curation efforts. Uh, we have the Commons a Conductor, which is a technology to facilitate building of OER. Uh, it's the only OER project management tool out there. It's freely available for everybody. Um, and I can give you a link off of that in a moment. We have some forums and chat rooms that are facilitate conversations uh, that's out there. Uh, so let me just talk about the libraries. Uh, well, I already mentioned that we are the largest central uh, infrastructure of OER textbooks on the internet today, uh, but we've actually been distributing OER content uh, aggressively. In fact, we're the, the most trafficated OER textbook infrastructure on the internet today. So we've uh, served over 1.1 billion pages since 2008. Uh, somewhere in the order of 900,000 page views daily. So we have to have an infrastructure in order to handle scale, and it does handle scale quite nicely. We deliver somewhere in the order of 20,000 page views. Actually, this is weekly, not daily, uh, that people can download. Uh, and uh, we've distributed somewhere in the order of 6,000 physical books a year. Um, so you can actually get a physical copy of your book by paying a printer in order to get print on demand. Uh, which we facilitate. And we're growing, and we're growing rapidly. We've been growing exponentially or pseudo exponentially for multiple years now. So any of our libraries, uh, uh, any of our libraries are organized uh, with content uh, in three different categories. Typically content is stored, uh, let me rephrase that, collections, which is collections of pages as a book, are stored in either central bookshelves right here or our campus books are right here. The central bookshelves are the ones that we are responsible for curating and we'll updating. Individual campuses and individual faculty on those campuses can customize their own book uh, and host them in the campus bookshelves. Uh, and any campus anywhere in the world can get up to free books free. We don't actually have any buy-in. You don't need to pay for it in order to be able to, to do that. You can just do it right now. The key point here, uh, and I mentioned this earlier on, is that Textbooks are not tube socks. Uh, one size doesn't fit all, uh, and there's a need for faculty in order to customize the textbooks to suit their individual needs, whether that means identifying what pages or what sections they want to add or subtract from the book, because most books are bigger than what the, the courses are uh, designed in order to teach, or it's to be able to introduce more customized or edit customized things. So this provides an opportunity for, for giving you the flexibility in order to customize and, and host it, but the stability associated with the centralized repository. So it's this yin-yang approach that we have here that's been working quite productively over the last um, decade or so since we've been doing that. Um, the other section is uh, learning objects. So these things host books, collection of pages that are organized uh, around in, as a book. Uh, learning objects are pages uh, that are not organized around a collection, at least not around a textbook collection. They may be something that was a little bit bigger. For example, in chemistry, we have our labs there. So you can go in and find a repository of labs. They're not formulated as a book. You can do a search and say, I want this, I want this one, and be able to run with it. Or other learning objectives, visualizations, simulations, uh, other different uh, activities, oftentimes capitalizing on the technologies that I mentioned before. The key point is that when an individual is building an OER textbook, there is no comprehensive infrastructure that's better than LibreText to come in in order to be able to pick and choose content from a variety of sources easily, seamlessly, and integratable in order to handle what we want to be able to do uh, as practitioners. So the upshot of what we're doing here is 
<clears throat> acting as a repository is that we're building a bigger bucket of Legos. Uh, and the idea behind that is that content, OER content, can be distributed in a variety of different sources. Uh, let me phrase that, a variety of different platforms and a variety of different places. Content can come up, content can go down. Uh, and what we do is we take the content, integrate that, and standardize it in order to make it so that you, as a faculty member that's building OER, <laughs> um, will be limited, ideally, when the bucket gets big enough, only by your imagination. Uh, in other words, all the content is interconnected. So it's centralized, it's standardized. So for example, if you're trying to copy OER content from a PDF, anyone who's ever copied from a PDF and pasted it into a Word document, you have lots of formatting junk, okay? We go through that in order to clean that up so you don't have to deal with that in order to make the barrier in order to use other people's content, AKA remixing, as low as possible. Uh, so we go through that pain so that you don't have to. Uh, it makes interconvertible infrastructures. It lets you build collections like textbooks, provides maximum flexibility. It also provides maximal curatability because if we organize it in a certain way that we do, we can make it so that we, we can coherently move forward. So for example, if you have the same textbook, like the same OpenStax book that 10 different individuals and in 10 different campuses have customized in some way or another you know, on whatever platform they happen to have. And they've each customized it in a different way in 10 different chapters. So the 11th person comes in and what do they choose? If they want to be able to take the book and benefit from what the other people have done, assuming that they've improved it, not just customized it. But they want to improve it. Which book did they do? Well, there's no single book that reflects all the societal updates. In this case here, 10 people in order to be able to move it forward. So what we're dealing with right now in the OER community is two steps forward, one step back because we're not controlling our revision. We don't have a central versioning infrastructure, which is actually particularly difficult across multiple platforms. Um, and this is what we do by centralizing the infrastructure so that when you update a book, when we update a book, everybody can benefit across the board. Uh, and that right there is a defining characteristic of us. So we stop trying to do a step back every time we do two step forwards. And it's a big picture that's going to, this is an issue that's going to grow and become harder and harder of an issue as OER starts to grow. I'm afraid that OER is growing quite strongly now. Uh, uh, and we have lots of activities and things need to be organized in a certain way. That's where the Commons conductor can uh, step in. So we have this big infrastructure of 600,000 pages of content, of OER content. We built a technology that's called the OER Remixer, or just the Remixer, that facilitates remixing the content. So it's a simple drag and drop widget that you can come in and you can just build your book on the left side by dragging pages from the right side. And those pages are all any of the 600,000 pages that we have. Now, it's just a simple drag and drop. And if you do this thing e effectively, uh, we have the auto number set up that automatically handles your numbers. And if you do it, if we do it right, uh, and we update all the pages, all the figure numbers, all the equation numbers, all the table numbers will be reflected by the uh, title number, and that will automatically be put in place. Again, the goal here is to take remixing and move the barrier in order to be able to build a book as quickly as possible, as effectively as possible, and make it so that faculty don't have to have as much dedicated time or resources and pain in order to be able to build their book. This is one of the uh, bigger uh, technologies, uh, signature technologies that we're doing and received an Open Ed Award um, from Open Ed Global last year uh, about that. I mentioned curation as a central theme behind how uh, the LibreTex operates. We have a, a powerful set of bots. Um, bots are scripts that go through page after page in order to be able to update certain things. Uh, that's useful in a variety of cases. When we actually harvest, when we, phrase it, when we publish a book and move it from a sandbox into the big book, we go through multiple bots in order to be able to standardize and fix issues and fix accessibility things and other things like that. It's not all, it's all powerful, but it's not necessarily um, applicable for every single book, but it does give us the ability in order to do things at scale. Much of the power behind that is using an infrastructure called regular expressions. If you're familiar with that tool, you understand it's a very powerful infrastructure for finding and replacing things. If you also have any experience with it, you understand it's really quite a pain in the butt in order to be able to use. But we've mastered it over the last 15 years. Um, I mentioned uh, building the textbook of the future, building a book that has technology in it. So I don't know that what the textbook of the future is going to look like, but I do know it's going to be technology enabled in some way or another. And this is an example of a uh, widget, a Jupyter Notebook 
or Jupiter infrastructure that's embedded into my quantum mechanics class, my book I use for my upper divisional quantum mechanics class. This is a particle in the box uh, uh, infrastructure. Students can see the code here. They can modify the code, in this case here, Python, and they can see the simulations right here, or they can just interact with the widgets when it actually gives various numbers right there. You can use it as a interface and they don't need to see the code that's on there. We have up to 30 different languages that we have available here, although about six or seven are the only ones that people have asked uh, for here. Uh, so part of the accessibility infrastructure, it's part of what we need to do, um, and both you need to do for OER, you have a legal and ethical requirement in order to ensure that the content that's generated is it, it has a maximal impact for your students. In other words, you're not excluding any of your students in order to be able to capitalize on what you've used. That's codified in uh, accessibility requirements, especially in the Americans with Disabilities Act uh, back in, I think, 1992 when it was released, uh, codified on the web via the WCAG the protocol. We follow 2.1 right now. Uh, and the, the argument is to be able to make something that is flexible uh, and powerful for across the board. This could be a very time consuming process, very important process. Again, we both have an ethical and legal requirement in order to do that, and there are several examples of lawsuits uh, uh, dedicated against campuses and districts because they haven't followed this appropriately. So what we have is to build an infrastructure that facilitates reviewing a text, organization, videos, homework, our interactive elements, and everything else that follows on here. So we have several tools in order to facilitate that. Uh, one is a uh, an editor, a real-time editor, a uh, checker that's part of our editor. So when faculty are editing content on our pages, they can click a button and they'll do a check of the top 10 biggest issues associated with accessibility. It's not comprehensive for every single aspect of accessibility, but does provide a major tool in order to help build OER content that's constructive. There's no OER platform on the internet today that provides you with this infrastructure. Uh, and if people want to see that real time, I can certainly pull it up at the, the end of this conversation. Um, I mentioned accessibility, part of uh, or bots, part of our bots are also accessibility. So we have an accessibility bot that goes through. The two big bots that we use on every resource is one is called the Brad bot, and then the other one is called the accessibility or Alley bot. The Brad bot is named after Brad Pitt because it makes pages pretty by going through and standardizing them. Uh, and the Alley bot is designed in order to handle accessibility, things behind the scenes that are programmatic in order to make sure that. Um, screen readers, for example, are able to utilize this effectively. So we have a variety of different mechanisms to distribute content. I, I mentioned already the internet where we distribute 900,000 pages of content daily. <clears throat> uh, we also can generate PDFs of every compiled book. Uh, you can embed those uh, the content uh, in your book into your learning management system via common cartridge. It's a very simple delay. It doesn't require permission from IT or Canvas administrators in order to do that. You can get the print files that you could print up yourself if you want. Uh, we will have an EPUB uh, option. We thought it was going to be done this summer. It's going to be later on this uh, fall. Um, <clears throat> um, you can get print physical books by going to Lulu Express, where we just basically act as an intermediary in order to hand off your books out there. So it's at cost or nearly at cost. There's a little bit of a markup, but it's not anything close enough in order to uh, cover our costs of operating. It's part of our service to the community. Uh, and lastly, we have an infrastructure where we can actually load Raspberry Pi boxes with our textbooks, with our content. We're hoping to expand that also with the homework system, such that students that don't have access to high-speed internet uh, can, uh, can capitalize on this uh, uh, on our resources. This was developed uh, or built for developing countries, um, but we noticed during the pandemic that there were a lot of populations in America that had limited access to the internet, and this could provide as a mechanism in order to distribute that content. Okay, so that's roughly the libraries. Uh, let me go into the other technologies of the Libriverse. So the one that we released about a year ago, and we've been pushing quite hard, is the Commons and Conductor. Uh, infrastructure. That's a very peculiar name. Uh, I understand that. But the Commons Conductor, you can access at commons.libertex.org. You can get a free account in the upper right-hand uh, version. I already mentioned it from the context of a OER dedicated learning management tool. So one of the issues that we have with, with the way we operate, because we are involved in curating and building our content, and facilitating other people who are building and curating their content is that we have lots of activity and lots of conversations that's necessary in order to be able to address. Using a standard email-based approach, 
was becoming unwieldy. We just couldn't do it. Uh, so we needed to have a technology in order to facilitate that, a learning management technology, specifically, um, sorry, a, um, a, a project management technology in order to facilitate that. We tried a variety of different commercial technologies out there. None of them actually suited what we wanted or they were particularly expensive because they were designed in order to operate at an enterprise level for companies that were paying lots of money for that. So we created the Commons and Conductor. Uh, it's a very peculiar name because it has two facets. The first facet is the Commons, which is the front end. That's what anyone can access without an account. And the back end is the Conductor. So we use the term Commons, Conductor, or Commons Conductor almost interchangeably, um, but in a very nuanced uh, fashion. Um, so the Commons, um, again, is a front end facing cataloging of books, of libraries, collections, homework under development. It gives a mechanism in order to show what's being done by the people who are contributing to the Libreverse or building on the Libreverse. And that includes not just within our development team, for any other campus as part of our LibreNet, which is our consortium um, that's out there. Uh, we have two flavors. We have our central commons, which this site goes to. And then any campus that is part of our LibreNet, our consortium, gets their own branded commons. And that provides an opportunity in order to collect only the books. They collect, have access to all the books, but they can showcase the books for their shareholders. Um, so uh, whether those happen to be students, faculty, administrators, benefactors, you can basically say, here are the books that are being used on my campus. And you can go and pick and choose a row of it. But again, you have access to thousands and thousands of other books that are, that are there. The back end is the conductor that requires an account in order to sign in. Again, it's freely available in the upper right-hand corner of, um, uh, of of this website. <laughs> uh, you get an account on there. Uh, if you request it, uh, we can verify it. So you're a verified instructor. So you get access to protected material that you wouldn't get if you weren't a verified instructor. Um, it's a project management tool. Um, so every project that's created has a back conductor page, which gives us the ability to keep track of communication, keep track of organization, keep track of activity. And then at any point later on, we can go back to it and say, what was the state of affairs for this, this project? What do we need to address? Um, and such. Um, it provides an opportunity for alert settings. So once you get an account on, you can come in and say, tell me if anything in the Libreverse comes in that's associated with a specific topic, like calculus. So if any calculus book comes in, you're going to get notified of that. Um, so it's very useful for people who are trying to keep track of the state of affairs for a specific uh, infrastructure. You can facilitate harvesting requests. Harvesting is our turn for saying, taking OER content that's not on our site and bring it into our site. Now, some cases that can be easy, some cases that can be hard, depending upon the nature of the site and the platform uh, format that the uh, content is put in place. Um, but the key point is that if you are sitting on OER or you need OER in order to facilitate remixing of a book that you want to build within our infrastructure, you can request us to go through that pain of integrating it so you don't need to worry about doing so and making it so that it, it satisfies as much of the ADA requirements uh, as necessary. You can facilitate adoption requests. This is useful in order to maintain uh, tracking of who's using your books uh, and then using that as a mechanism for providing data uh, to relevant stakeholders. Um, you can facilitate peer review within our infrastructure because again, like I said, everything is cyclical here. Publishing is not the end goal. Pub publishing is just the start and getting feedback from the community is very important in order to be able to update those things. Facilitates communication amongst the team, facilitates communication across different teams on different campuses that may be focusing on similar uh, construction efforts. And you can look at any of the progress uh, public projects in the LibreNet instances. Again, this is a freely available resource that you could tap into and use it now. Uh, and um, I'll show you just a, a few snippets of it, but uh, it's a very useful uh, starting point in terms of building OER and ending point. Uh, so the commons, uh, this is the front end of it. This is just a snippet of the bottom end. Uh, I think this is Los Rios Community College branded instance. So these are all the books uh, here, 87 books that this community college district has uh, organized and put together for their district. Uh, some of them are customized uh, versions of books. Some are fully remixed versions. Some are completely unique books that they've created, but it's a central repository they're able to go to. And this is what we uh, provide to uh, 
LibreNet members uh, that's that's out there. The back end, the conductor, like I mentioned, when you sign in, uh, gives you access to these things. So here's an access to uh, the top end of a project. It's again, a bit more complicated than this. That just shows you some of the capabilities that we have, some of the status up of things, communication lines that are off of here. Um, and there are threads, lines, uh, Gantt plot, uh, and other things. All of the thing that we felt was necessary in order to be able to advance uh, building of OER, again, because we're practitioners, we use these things uh, and are constantly updating them. So the ADAPT homework system uh, is the last thing that I'll talk about. I could talk about those other parts if people ask that later on, uh, which is what we'll be focusing on uh, for the remainder of this presentation. Uh, <clears throat> so we knew that we wanted to build a homework system from almost the beginning. From back in 2008, 2009, we started looking at uh, technologies in order to facilitate that. But the issue with building a homework system is that homework, the technology behind that is particularly uh, difficult in order to be able to implement. It's far more complicated than just having a website that you host content on a database and you show it, or an editor that you put on the front end in order to be able to facilitate that. So uh, it took us a while in order to be able to do that. The One of the reasons that it's particularly awkward is that you need to use it summatively, meaning that students need to sign in, keep track of their scores, and be able to handle that securely, and also distribute that to learning management systems uh, and such, and make it so the question types are powerful in order to handle a wide variety of different uh, approaches. So we wanted to build this homework infrastructure to complement our textbooks. Uh, we went through multiple failed attempts. Um, so if you want to, me to uh, tell you about our failures. I'm certainly uh, comfortable in order to tell you that, um, in part because I think we're being successful nowadays. So guiding what we're doing is a series of questions. So we wanna build an infrastructure that's flexible, dynamic, comprehensive, integrated, LMS agnostic, uh, powerful and free or nearly free. And these are the criteria that we were using in order to pursue building a homework system. And we just started getting successful the last few years you know, 10 years plus after we started pursuing this. Uh, and the reason for that is it take a, takes a lot of time uh, and, and you need to do it very efficiently because there's just too many things moving on. But I'm happy in order to report this because this provides a very valuable component in order to complement textbooks out there. Again, providing this one-stop shopping adventure experience <clears throat> that supplants or meant to supplant a commercial product. Uh, so the idea behind what we're trying to do is not to reinvent the wheel. So utilize, and, and this follows all of OER, right? The sharing is caring model off of that. But in technology, we're using open source technologies, open source licenses, which is similar to uh, OER licenses, although not identical. And we want to be able to capitalize on what other people have done and not build things from scratch. Uh, so the result of that is a system that we call ADAPT. Um, and I'll mention why ADAPT is called that uh, momentarily, but the key point behind ADAPT is to provide a complement to the textbooks that is as powerful as commercial infrastructures out there. Um, and fortunately, we've gotten a significant investment of funds, uh, both from the U.S. Department of Education that kickstarted this thing, but uh, most recently from the California, the state of California uh, that invested this, this approach up to now. Uh, the total amount of investment is somewhere in the order of about five and a half million dollars. The key point is that even if you're not in California, which I understand, uh, um, you can still capitalize on what the investment was uh, here for you or what the result is from their investment. So um, what's the result of this before I start getting into the details? Well, the ADAPT infrastructure provides a powerful question bank that you can tap into. Uh, right now, it's about 170,000 questions. This is a little bit old. <clears throat> um, I don't know any faculty member that doesn't want to have access to a massive question bank. And you have free access to verified instructors anywhere in the world. You come in, you can do searches, you can find resources, you can use it as you decide you want to do that as long as you don't um, you know, start to distribute it to your students freely and goes on Chegg and Course Hero and other things like that, which uh, compromises the entire corpus for everybody. Um, and this is freely available for everybody. Uh, if the faculty members in the state of California, because California invested you know, five, five million dollars into this, uh, the homework, the technology part of that is freely available for all students and faculty. 
Uh, now I'm aware that I'm not talking to Californians, or at least not most Californians in this room. Um, so what is this for other Californians? So the the point that I, before I mention this is that OER that no <laughs> OER is not free. Uh, we'd like to say it's free, uh, uh, but it's never free. Uh, there's always someone who contributes something, whether they contribute time. They contribute some financial support, whether that's from uh, various sources. The question always is who's paying for it and how much are they paying for it? And the same thing applies to the textbooks. Same thing applies to our books that we're doing it. We're doing this and giving it freely because we have benefactors, aka the government, that are making this so that you guys can, can capitalize on it effectively, or you contribute via LibreNet, which is a very small contribution to what we're doing here. The same thing applies to the homework system. In fact, it's much harder for the homework system because ADAPT actually has somewhere in the order of eight independent servers that are running all in unison in order to be able to provide all the power that we want to be able to provide uh, to you guys. And that requires a bit of buy-in. So any faculty member or any uh, student in outside the state that's part of a faculty member's course can have access to ADAPT for uh, $15 a term and a maximum of $30 per year, comprehensive across as many courses. So that's somewhere in the order of one seventh to one tenth of a commercial product. Uh, uh, and ideally, if a campus pays for it, which is what we want, uh, then it gets reduced uh, uh, to $10 a, um, uh, a student uh, per term. Again, $30 is the maximum amount that a student will ever pay. They can take 100 classes. It's $30, uh, and that's uh, for 12 months. So they get summers for free if they want to do it. Again, the point that we have is just maintaining sustainability because uh, – and it should be clear across all OER platform, all OER efforts is that sustainability is a critical component in terms of what you're doing when you're investing. So that's out of the way. People have questions about that. I'm certainly willing in order to address it. So what about ADAPT? Um, before I start about ADAPT, I want to give you some of the philosophies and the organizations of ADAPT uh, because it makes a little bit of sense to discuss it outside of looking at ADAPT. So ADAPT is designed in a very flexible manner like what I was mentioning before. Uh, <clears throat> And the key point is that we wanted to build an infrastructure that was useful for a variety of different fields, uh, not just chemistry, um, but math, biology, Spanish, uh, and variety of other things. There's no single technology that's able to cover all those use cases um, without having you know the basic trivial things like multiple choice and other things like that. Okay, so more advanced technologies is what I'm referring to, which is where I, I want to go with what we're doing. So our approach in order to do that is instead of trying to push one technology beyond its utility is to just commandeer, capitalizing on the open and open licensing, other content, other programs and integrate it into our platform as a central infrastructure that faculty can utilize. And they can pick and choose what technologies they want to use in order to address their needs in their classroom. So that means that things, this explains why we have multiple servers running, as I mentioned before. Uh, so we have two types of question questions. We have the auto grade questions, and then we have the open-ended questions. So the auto grade questions are the questions where we have technology that evaluates the submissions in order to be able to give you a score, give a student a score, put it into the grade book. Open-ended questions are questions that require a human in order to be able to evaluate. Uh, and there are just question types uh, uh, in courses that require um, both. Uh, in many upper divisional classes, most of them are open-ended. I'm fortunate in that I have TAs that uh, are paid in order to facilitate grading, so I don't have to do as much uh, grading as uh, faculty uh, outside of large uh, universities. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but nonetheless, they're just approaches in order to do that. So auto-grading uh, right now is set up in four different technologies. We use web work. Uh, IMATH AS, uh, native technology in H5P. Uh, so WebWork is a technology organized around, focused on math and statistics and a bit of engineering out of the University of Rochester. Mike Gage uh, started that back in 1995, back when the term web was very exciting, hence the word WebWork. IMATH AS is homegrown to you guys uh, out of uh, David Littman from Pierce College, uh, and that's the technology underlying MyOpenMath or WAMAP uh, for you guys. Uh, native technology is essentially the technology that we integrated into uh, ADAPT, the, the technology that overlays these things, um, and that includes QTI, 
QTI is question test interoperability. I'm not trying to throw too many acronyms your way, but that's essentially the technology that underlies the questions that you have in your learning management system. So in other words, if you have a question bank in your learning management system, we can integrate it into ADAPT. Again, building the central corpus of questions that everyone can capitalize on instead of trying to find little snippets here and there in different spots, bring it together, and then make everyone benefit from that. And lastly, you have H5P. H5P uh, is a technology that's been around for about 10 years. It's a very graphical visual technology that's useful for a variety of different graphical visual uh, needs. It can also do uh, simple versions of these things, uh, but not nearly as advanced. Up here. I, I will mention this analogy in terms of discussing these technologies is that each of these technologies has their own uh, um, writing and editor infrastructure. So if someone builds something in web work, that doesn't work in iMathAS or vice versa. Yeah. Or the same thing off of these. So they're all independent services. Um, but the way I like to view these things is like going to a restaurant. So when you go to a restaurant and you go to the front and you sit down, you get your menu. Uh, and your menu has 10, 20, 30 different pre-made collections of books or collections of technologies. In this case here, the technologies, but in those cases uh, of dishes. And you pick the dish that you want. Uh, that's essentially what native and H5P is. You're coming in and you pick one of 20, 30, 50 different types of questions, and then you populate them. And that's all you can do. You can't do anything else. It's just like in your learning management system. These are the questions you can do. And that's that. Mm -hmm. Web work and IMATH AS is tantamount to going to the back end of the restaurant, going to the kitchen. Uh, and now you have access to everything, every ingredient, and you can create anything you want. Now, it may be a monstrosity, it may be something beautiful, but you have the power in order to do that. But that requires a greater skill set in order to be able to use these things, let me rephrase that, to build these things than it is to build these questions. However, fortunately, once they're built, anybody can use them. So when the corpus is constructed in this way here, you can get master gourmet chefs building the greatest selection of powerful dishes that you have available, and you can start to pick and choose the ones that you want to do. And that's the key point is independent of any of the technologies you do, ADAPT lets you pick and choose and do it uh, without having to be concerned about how they're constructed, how they're used, or any of the finer details behind it because ADAPT centralizes that. Open any questions require, is it, is it, requires building a facilitated grader, we call it open grader, that lets the students come, lets a grader, which may be a TA, maybe the instructor, grade submissions that people give, uh, students give. Students can submit via text, they can submit via audio tech, audio, where they can actually upload it, useful for second languages, music uh, classes. They can upload files, PDFs, Excel, drawings, pictures. Uh, um, there's a wide range of things, but the key point is they require a human in order to do that. However, I'm not entirely sure where ChatGPT may come in in order to facilitate that. We are playing with that in order to facilitate technical writing, grading, technical writing, um, facilitating the grading of technical writing, but not grading itself because I'm still very concerned about where that AI is going. Okay. Uh -huh. Let me just mention this. So any homework system, Weber, for example, has multiple services, multiple components to it. It has a builder, problem builder, problem library, problem searcher, assessment delivery, assessment checker, grade book, and interface. Uh, my open math, iMath, WallMap, OM, whatever has the same infrastructure. Uh, H5P would have the same infrastructure. QTI in your learning management system has the same infrastructure. So if you want to master all four of these technologies, you need to master all of this block. Now, and this is the reason why people don't tend to master multiple technologies out there. They pick the one that they go with and they run with that. What we've done is we take these things and we actually centralize the library, the search capability, the grade book, and the LMS. So once you learn how to interface with ADAPT, then it doesn't matter uh, for those four purposes whether which of these technologies you're using. Of course, it matters about which of how you build it because uh, it has different services. Um, the the delivery is different, but you don't really see that. The check checker is different, but you don't see that. It's underneath the hood. The key point is that you're making an integrated infrastructure to bring these things all together and new technologies that we are pursuing right now, again, thanks to the state of California. ADAPT is built for multimodal use. <laughs> so uh, faculty have a variety of different pedagogies of how they want to use homework systems. Uh, and when I mean Pedagogies, in this sense, I'm talking about the modalities of how students interact with it. 
And specifically, students can interact uh, with ADAPT via the ADAPT website. Um, which you can access at adapt.libertext.org. Um, <clears throat> faculty can uh, embed questions from ADAPT into their textbook. Again, makes the textbook of the future. So now the textbook becomes a homework system. So we have a variety of faculty that are using this as their homework system. Uh, and students go to their textbook and their uh, the homework is embedded right with the content that they're supposed to be reading. The argument that we have off of there is that the anything that increases the engagement between the student and the textbook increases learning. That's an argument. I don't have any research in order to be able to back this approach as being superior to this approach, although I have a desire. I do believe it is the case. We're going to be releasing um, in a month or two uh, a mobile personal response system. Let me phrase that, a mobile app. So in other words, an adapt on a phone that students can use in order to be able to do their homework because students uh, we've recognized have access uh, our pages about just as likely with a phone as they are doing it with a web with a computer. Uh, <clears throat> but this infrastructure, which is available to anyone who's using Adapt, uh, they can download it when we up when we build our stores. They can uh, also use this as an in-class clicker system. So you don't have to pay for clickers, eye clickers, turning or whatever. ADAPT can supplant that and provide a mechanism in order to interact between the student and the faculty member uh, in the classroom. Uh, and that couples then with uh, into grades or scores that can be also formative. It doesn't have to be summative. Uh, the key point is it's a powerful infrastructure in order to augment what ADAPT provides faculty. And lastly, uh, and, and actually applies to all of them, um, you can uh, you can pass back the scores directly to your learning management system. Uh, so as soon as a student submits the result, it goes to your LMS gradebook and you're ready to rock. Or you can use a, a ADAPT independent of your LMS, download a CSV file of, of the grades and then upload it right there. Uh, we wipe grades. Uh, we wipe all student submissions 100 days after the class is over because we don't want to sit on the data. Um, this is an example of embedding a specific type of question. This is H5P. Uh, this is an uh, intermediate nutrition uh, question in an intermediate nutrition textbook where the students can come in and answer the question directly there. Uh, one of the nice things about this sort of infrastructure provides a centralized uh, approach in order to be able to um, to tie together how students are interacting with the book and how they're interacting with the homework system together within our learning analytics tool, which I'll be talking about again momentarily. So the I mentioned our mobile phone app. Um, this is a video of it. Um, and basically, any question that you create can be embedded into the mobile phone app and used either as an in-class uh, clicker infrastructure uh, or uh, as a, a homework uh, infrastructure. Um, so it provides a, uh, a, a reduced barrier for students in order to, um, to use their homework. And anything that reduces the barrier for students doing the homework is a good thing. Um, this, for example, is an H5P exercise. So if you have a collection of H5P exercises that you already created anywhere, they can be imported into our infrastructure. Our repository that we use to host it is called Studio. And once it's in Studio, it automatically goes to Adapt, and then you're able to use it right here. And students can uh, submit it, and you can get the information that you want uh, off of there. Lastly, uh, Adapt is designed for uh, different form factors of sorts. Um, so one uh, way in order to deliver questions to students is as traditional approach. So in other words, you have courses, courses have assignments, assignments have questions. Those assignments are released at a certain date and a certain time. They're closed at a certain date and a certain time. Students submit the scores. They may get real-time feedback. They may not get real-time feedback, depending upon how you want to do it. And that's a more traditional way in which you do it. It's something similar to every LMS that does these sort of things. Now, I mentioned about why ADAPT is called ADAPT. As I said, there is a reason behind it. And the reason behind it is that ADAPT has uh, adaptive learning capabilities. So if you're familiar with adaptive learning, adaptive learning um, in general basically means that individual students will have different individual experiences with what they're doing. So the intent off of it from our perspective is to build a virtual tutor which is actually the term that's used in the community, something in order to take the place of $50 or $100 an hour, I'm not sure how much tutors go for, in order to be able to help students learn the material that we have. 
So you can make homework into a learning adventure, which is how ideally most homework should be. So our approach for doing that is relying on not a complex black box algorithm uh, re recommender engine uh, approach that just spoon feeds what students need to read uh, or do based off of their experience. We've, we facilitate something a little bit different, a, a white box. That means you know what's going on underneath it, not algorithm based or not significantly algorithm based, something close to a choose your own adventure story. This follows what's referred to as decision trees. Uh, in the field, we call them learning trees because they're, I want to focus more on learning here. And the idea behind this, again, is a choose your own adventure story. Instead of giving a single question for students, uh, we give a single root question at the top of a tree that the student gets. So instead of a assignment of multiple questions, they have an assignment of trees. Think of it as an orchard if you want. Um, and the idea is that when the student goes through this question, if they get the question wrong, we'll provide an incentive for them to uh, to get that, have an opportunity to do that question again. However, the incentive requires that they actually go into the learning tree, which is a series of nodes, individual blocks, that either deals with exposition, some educational part, or uh, questions in order to evaluate whether they understand it. And the idea is that they demonstrate some proficiency in the learning trees. They spend some time in the learning trees. Uh, they then can earn their reset. And once they earn the reset, they can come back up and do the question again. And if they fail there, they can go back into the tree and earn it again. And the idea is to provide an opportunity for students to be engaged with the material, let me phrase that, to build agency or exercise agency. Because the more that the students are engaged with their education, the, the greater their learning is that's involved in that, at least productive engagement, uh, that is. And this is productive. So these nodes can be text. They can be videos, they can be uh, Socratic visualizations, um, and you provide the students the opportunity in order to figure out where they want to go. The way that I typically do it is that when they come in here, I identify multiple skills that they need in order to master to do the question, and then each branch here deals with a specific skill, and I want them to learn that skill and then demonstrate proficiency, and then they have the opportunity to come back up here. They can choose and say, oh, well, they know this skill very well, so they're going to ignore that branch, and they go to a different branch. The idea is to get them involved. This right here builds self-efficacy. It builds metacognition, because now students are actually thinking about what they learn, what they need to learn, what they have learned, and put it all into a context, and that right there builds more robust students graduates than a black box that's spoon feeding what they're doing and that no one knows what goes in uh, what what's going on inside the black box including the students uh, and this is a much more coherent approach in order to do that there's plenty of evidence in order to argue that this sort of simplified approach simpler that is than the black box algorithm uh, is much better than just a traditional question uh, the issue that we have here is that it takes time in order to build a tree now, but we are working on building that. Um, our current grant with the state of California is to build 500 trees every year for the next four years, in addition to a wide variety of other things. So there's much more comprehensive uh, infrastructure, but this right here provides, is a more powerful educational experience. That's why ADAPT is called ADAPT. Okay. Let's see here. I have a little bit more time. Um, presume you guys want to see some things uh, live. Um, so I'm just about tailing in uh, to this thing. So I want to mention a few things regarding homework, because it's important in order to be able to emphasize this when looking at homework systems or open source or OER homework systems. So of those four technologies I mentioned before for auto-graded, WebWork, IMATH-AS, uh, QTI, and H5P, there are two facets in order to pay attention to when you're looking at these things. One is whether the question evaluation is done on our computer or on the student's computer. If it's on our computer, it's called server side. If it's on the individual student's computer, it's called client side, just the terminology used in that community. Web work, IMATH AS, and QTI are all server side evaluation. What that means is that it's secure. Let me phrase that. What it means is that students can't easily hack into the question in order to game it and submit the right answer. So it's a good infrastructure for secure homework, which is what you probably want all your homework to be. H5P is client side. What that means is that when you give an H5P exercise to a student on any platform, 
whether it's ours or press books or other other things they're they're like 10 different platforms that can use these things um a student can hack into and get the answer you can look at the source of the code which is easy on the web browser if you're not that uh technologically savvy you can turn off your internet submit the answer get the answer turn on your internet and submit it so if you use h5p you should use it for either formative use or very low stakes stakes summative use but never for high uh high stakes and this is exceedingly important because there are individuals out there that are pushing people that say that h5p is a homework solution it is not currently a homework solution so if anyone tells you that they are either lying or incompetent uh, and it upsets me that that there's a lot of these things out there in the community. The second one is accessibility. Remember, going back to the requirement that we need to have for our, our content. Um, <clears throat> web work, IMATH-AS, and QTI gives us full ability in order to cut into the code and address accessibility. Uh, <clears throat> H5P uh, gives us limited control in order to be able to do that and still couple in with the existing infrastructure of the H5P network. So a partial accessibility. So while we can address accessibility questions and concerns here, when there are accessibility concerns with H5P and there are a lot of them, the best we can do is provide a guidance um, in terms of how students, sorry, how faculty who are building questions should build questions to be as accessible as possible. And we have the biggest collection of accessibility guidelines for individual questions on our studio, which again is this is where we host the H5P. Now we have other technologies that we are working on, integrating organic chemistry infrastructure, so you can actually build molecules, submit them. Spreadsheets are useful for Excel, sorry, useful for accounting, they're useful for uh, some types of statistics. Jupyter will be integrated in our infrastructure, so you can actually submit code. Uh, uh, and I already mentioned clicker systems, uh, and there's a bunch more technologies that we're building, again, thanks to the state of California and their sizable investment in what we are doing. Okay, so let me tie this all together into one big picture. here. We have multiple technologies and approaches that ADAPT provides you, whether it's web work, IMAP, AS, H5P, QTI, um, or open-ended. These things can all be used directly for ADAPT. ADAPT questions, any of these things can be folded into your textbook, they can be folded into um, the textbook can be embedded into your learning management system. Adapt can be embedded directly into your learning management system. Uh, and all of these things can be done on the web, uh, on the phone uh, in the near future so that you can choose what works best for you. Different faculty use it in different ways. So I mentioned H5P a bit just in order to uh, distinguish it from the other technologies out there. The repository that we have for H5P is found at studio.libertext.org. Anyone um, using the Libertext can use uh, the studio. we will give a free account for you. Just contact me and I'll give you the access code in order to get your free account in order to be able to sign in. And you can start creating questions or uploading questions and use them as you see fit. Um, you can embed them in, again into our textbooks. You can embed them into other people's textbooks. Um, uh, if you want, um, it makes me cry if you do that, but nonetheless, uh, it's available for you as a central repository. Again, because this is essential, when someone updates the question, then everyone else benefits from it. Uh, and like I said, a lot of these questions have accessibility issues that were, um, that the question needs to be updated significantly in order to be able to, uh, to work. Um, and, uh, by keeping things fragmented so that different H5P is only embedded in different books and different books are distributed over there. When you update one, no one else gets uh, gets updated. It's not a centralized or federated infrastructure. This right here provides a mechanism in order to curate, move it so it's two steps forward and two steps forward without a step back. Okay, so this is what the ADAPT infrastructure looks like. Um, since I have time, I'll pull it up uh, so we can take a look at it. This right here just is my uh, personal uh, set of questions uh, that I've used where I have individual questions, uh, open dates, end dates. This thing is used in the same way that learning management systems are across the board, so it's not overly unique uh, in that approach. There are other aspects that are more unique and more powerful about ADAPT that's out there. Um, like I said, we have multiple technologies uh, that's available for you. I just wanted to show you what those technologies look like behind the scenes. This right here is a snippet of our editor. Um, every question has four blocks. One is some metadata. One is actually the content of the question. One is accessibility alternatives. Uh, and lastly, down here are uh, ancillary like solutions, um, 
uh, hints, notes, and other things like that. Every question is organized uh, in, in this way. Uh, and Pete, you can just choose which type of technology you want to do in order to be able to build the question that you do. Or you can make it open-ended where you can just type in some text um, or embed anything that would be normally embedded into a website. So pictures, videos, JavaScript, you can put into there uh, and it's all powerful. Um, this right here is how we build native QTI. Um, so question test interrupting. Remember that was the technology that underlies um, questioning in most learning management systems. Moodle is an exception. Um, so you basically select a set of question types and you can then go through the prompts not too dissimilar for how most of you have interacted with these questions in learning management systems again if you have a learning management system question bank and you want to share it with us that's openly licensed please contact me uh it brings it centralized and of course you have full attribution so other people can use your question and know that you are the ones that uh, you're the one that uh, that generated that uh, i will mention this Briefly, actually, this is uh, right here. Uh, we hooked up with the technical colleges in Wisconsin uh, earlier this year in order to expand uh, QTI to handle the next generation nursing infrastructure. For uh, those of you who are unfamiliar with this, is that the new protocols for um, it's called uh, NCLEX, uh, so it's the next generation nursing uh, evaluation protocols, requires new types of questions to be generated. Uh, we've integrated that into ADAPT. Uh, so right now, other companies are building that, but they're building it in order to charge $5,000, $4,000 per student per uh, access because it's lucrative for them to do that. And they get access to this for free as part of the adapt infrastructure. Uh, and I would love to be able to go through various types off here because they're really quite sophisticated uh, approaches off of here. We just don't have the time in order to do that. But if, if those of you that are in the nursing field, uh, you should be exposed to this. If not, highly recommend you uh, capitalize on what ADAPT provides you. Um, H5P. So again, H5P is accessed in our studio at studio.libretext.org. Um, and you can build questions in a very graphical interface. Every question type, whether it's H5P or it's native, has an underlying code that runs it. So in other words, you're raking a little mini program. In native and H5P, you don't know you're making a program because you're doing it graphically, but you are making a program. The other two technologies, you are explicitly writing a program. So if you're unfamiliar with writing structured code, then you may not be overly excited about this approach in order to build questions. Um, but if you want to get in the kitchen and build something unique, you need to deal with the sharp instruments, which is essentially coding. Uh, so this is what web work code looks like. This is a very simplified uh, infrastructure in order to be able to do that. For those, again, uh, of you that are familiar with some sort of structured programming, this may make a little bit of sense. Um, after you go through a little bit of training, this doesn't make, this is not that hard um, in order to grab a range of different templates that you then customize and edit uh, as you see fit. And we're working on ways in order to improve the editing experience. IMath AS, again, the technology underlying WAMAP and MyOpenMath and Lumen Learning's commercial OM system and other systems uh, is a very similar infrastructure, but it's more segmented where you can code in different blocks um, in order to be able to create your question types. It's a very powerful tool. David Lippman, who created this from Pierce College, did a beautiful job in order to be able to do that, especially given that he created it 100% himself, which is really impressive. Okay, I, I hinted at this before. Uh, we have a learning analytics infrastructure we released it and then we pulled it back a little bit because uh, we wanted to update it and integrate it better into the commons uh, tool, the commons and conductor tool that I showed before. Uh, but the, the intent behind that is to provide data on how students interact with the homework system. And if you want, you can make it so they can track how students interact with your textbook. So if you want to evaluate the efficacy of your textbook, evaluate whether students are truly learning from your textbook, which is the true criterion for success in OER in any textbook. Uh, this is the mechanism in order to do that. Uh, and you're able to pull it together and identifying when pages are read, you can identify when students are studying or when they're cramming. You can use this as a mechanism in order to see if you ask students to read something and they truly are reading it. Um, you can couple this with the ADAPT homework structure. So when your questions are aligned to frameworks, you say, are these learning objectives satisfied? What criteria, uh, what learning objectives may not be satisfied by certain criteria and how do you need to go back in order to address it? These are the learning analytics infrastructure that's necessary in order to use OER as a learning infrastructure 
not just basically as a material out there. In other words, building the textbook of the future. And we're very excited in order to re-release this probably in winter once I re-update it and integrate it into uh, the conductor. So I will end the conversation with ADAPT uh, with what I started with. How do you build an online homework system that's dynamic, flexible, comprehensive, co integrated, LMS agnostic, powerful, or nearly free? Uh, and the answer is very slowly, but we're doing it. We're doing it so you guys can take advantage of it. Uh, uh, and uh, we are committed to not making money off of this. In fact, we can't because a lot of the content we have has non-commercial clauses on it, so we can't make a profit at all, which is fine. That's our mission. Uh, we are a not-for-profit organization. Conflict, uh, compare that with other many other for-profit uh, uh, alternatives out there, which I can give you a long list of um, that, that you may be familiar with. So, um, I'll end again with what I started. Uh, our mission, we're implementing a community built platform for the construction, curation, adoption, and adaption of OER that's comprehensive and can be curated at multiple levels. I hope either after this presentation or after you have a chance to take a look at the Libreverse, if you haven't been exposed to it before, um, you'll come to the conclusion that we are doing a good job. I hope. <laughs> uh, and if not, please let me know. And we're very receptive in order to uh, address our development changes, because again, it's important for the community in order to step forward. And lastly, the very first thing is that students are not a market to exploit. That's the underlying approach behind uh, everybody that works in the Libra text and moving it forward is that it's a very goal-oriented perspective. Now, our goal is not to publish results. Our goal is in order to get free content into students' hands for them to learn. Uh, and if not all of you, I think are most of you are faculty, that should be all your mission missions right there. I will include all these links uh, in the PDF uh, for you to be able to review. We have lots of links because we have lots of components of the Libreverse. It's a moving system, evolving and growing, again, thanks to the investment of funds that we got from a variety of different sources. Um, and with that, I will thank you for your attention. We have about 15 minutes left. I can answer questions. I can go through any parts of the Libreverse. Just need to tell me how you guys would like to proceed. Well, let's see, do we have any questions? I think um, Maggie, you unmuted. Um, well, I have 15 questions, but maybe I'll just start <laughs> with one or two. Um, first, I just want to thank you because obviously um, this is, I know we've used the word Herculean here for a couple of people, but this truly is a Herculean task to even, even, conceptualize, nevertheless, code and make work together. So I just really want to thank you for all the work that you've done in that. Um, I, I have a, a couple of questions that really revolve around concerns given the community college environment, specifically in Washington, where we find ourselves. Um, and that is that in Washington, the community college environments, IT is primarily centralized in the state, um, which controls access to, um, you know, for all students to log in and their identities to be protected, um, for anyone to log into the LMS, which is Canvas. Um, and so my very first question is just in listening to everything that you've done, um, is how much does IT need to be involved to make this work um, within the Canvas infrastructure that we find ourselves? Uh, because it seems it's a lot. And I, um, so that would be, you know, some, there would have to be some lobbying about that and, and proof of, of why that would be necessary. Yeah. <clears throat> so, First, I may mention that I actually graduated from Edmonds Community College. Uh, however, I left the uh, system in 93, long before LMSs and all the infrastructure that's in place. Because I remember hand getting lines in order to be able to register for classes back when I was in high school. Um, so um, the, the, the role of IT depends upon what, how much of the levers you want to capitalize on. So if you want to build a book, you can build a book without involving IT. Uh, if you want to embed that book into Canvas, you can do that via common cartridges without involving IT. 
Well, most faculty can't do that. You doesn't don't really understand the how to use common cartridges, but yeah, but there are, but there they, are people. We, at the we, we have we have a, we have a short video off of it. It's actually about seventy seconds or something like that in order to be able to do it. So mm -hmm. it's it's fairly straightforward. Unless IT deactivated that ability, which I'd be very surprised if they did. Um, um, but I understand Canvas can be quite. Um, fun to, to learn uh, and I'm being <laughs> facetious there. Um, <clears throat> so, but what involves IT is um, the homework system and how you want the homework system to be used. So if you want to use the homework system completely detached from Canvas where you, up, you download the scores from ADAPT and you upload them, you don't need IT because that's just basically something similar to embedding a common cartridge. Uh, it, it's painful. I mean, it's not painful. It's just a little annoying in order to be able to do it, but it doesn't give you real-time feedback. It doesn't give students real-time feedback on the gradebook. What involves IT is coupling ADAPT into uh, Canvas via LTI. Um, and that passback requires, now that Canvas and every LMS is using the newest version of LTI, which is 1.3, uh, that is controlled 100% by the administrators. Before, faculty used to be able to do that, but that caused a lot of uh, security issues. So they've removed that. So we go through multiple campuses in order to facilitate that, um, you know, and whether that requires HECVATS or other documentation for handling FERPA and other things. We go through that protocols. Different campuses and different districts um, uh, uh, require their own different protocols in order to do that. But uh, it, we have four dozen or so uh, campuses that have already uh, done that. I think Highline Community College um, has done that and we're in the process of doing it for Western Washington. Uh, so we do have some activity going. I think there are a few other Washington campuses that I'm not, I don't remember off the top of my head that we're doing that. So it's it's quite possible. Some campuses have higher barriers than other campuses, um, but we're working on uh, showing all the documentation that we are in full compliance with being able to make that work. Sometimes it's quick, sometimes it's slow, um, but it doesn't mean that you can't use ADAPT uh, and then just pass the grades back. Or if you use it formatively, then any faculty member can, can run a class for free in the beginning just to test it out. Um, and it doesn't require a coupling to LTI in order to be able to, to do it. Okay. Um, I just have one other of my 15 that I'll ask and then give someone else the floor. Um, and that really has to do with accessibility. Mm -hmm. um, so everything is done online, um, which is the same with Canvas. Um, and I'm always concerned about um, when so much is done online, how that impacts people, particularly people with low vision or no vision, and also people with a variety of mobility issues, whether it's uh, fingers or or whatever. Um, so I know you said that, you know, you are, take accessibility in mind, but I just am wondering how deep that really is. So my accessibility person would flog me uh, if I don't um, handle things appropriately. Now, that being said, there is no such thing as, I mean, as you know, I presume you know that there isn't accessible or not accessible. It's it's a massive spectrum that's involved in terms of being able to address it at different points and different stages. So we try our best, which is more than most people in the community in making platforms in order to make this thing as the platform as accessible as possible, or we're constantly updating it. And we have ACRs in order to provide you the feedback in terms of where we're going uh, with that. That being said, because faculty can add whatever they want to pages, then it becomes an issue in terms of trying to make sure that they are creating things that are accessible. Um, now, we we can take two stances in order to do that. We can throttle down the flexibility of authors and force them to only work in certain uh, prescribed um, blocks, uh, but that really reduces academic freedom. It's not really academic, it reduces freedom in general in order to be able to build things. So we work on ways in order to provide feedback and use bots in order to be able to try to address those things. But that, but a lot of the responsibility is on the faculty member, the author specifically that are building it in order to make sure that that is fully compliant. Uh, our accessibility, uh, I mentioned the commons of conductor. 
Um, and this, this does dovetail into what you're doing. So let's say I'm taking a platform and I'm going to grab uh, this healthcare uh, book. So here's the healthcare book that I was talking about before, the Spanish healthcare book. And it has, you know, uh, tasks and it has threads and conversations up here. But what's more important is the accessibility block. So we built this infrastructure that will take the table of contents from your book, bring it all in uh, automatically right here. And this acts as a mini accessibility compliance review or ACR that individuals can come in and, uh, you know, our accessibility person has 81 criteria he uses in order to evaluate accessibility. Uh, uh, and they're they're written here. So right now we have 20 of them. They're, uh, a third of them deals with the platform. A third of them can be automated. Uh, and a third of them requires a human in order to be able to do. So this provides a mechanism in order to say, well, you've created this thing. Now you have someone review this. And we actually have an accessibility team of students from disability centers that come in and help evaluate these things using part of that tool that I said for uh, for Chucker, and they come in and they say, yes, uh, can you use, uh, you know, keyboard to access all content display? And they confirm that, they flip that button, and now that is backlogged and tracked, and now we know that page has handled that. And we can have them go through multiple pages uh, and have the, the students focus on uh, addressing that. Some things like this, like our all, all text under 150 characters, that we have a bot that will go through in order to evaluate that that's fine, but a bot can't evaluate if the text is meaningful. Right. You know, that requires him. So the, 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 we have an infrastructure that's more, more advanced than anything else out there in the OER landscape in order to be able to facilitate tracking and monitoring what's being done here. So we don't just give, here's a checklist of 10 things that you just click off and now it's accessible because that's not what OER is. I mean, that's not what accessibility is. You need to have this manifestation out here in order to be able to facilitate that. Um, and um, that's it. So that's that's part of our commitment in addition to our checker, in addition to our bots, in addition to um, lots of things. This is our Beeline Reader, uh, which is meant in order to handle dyslexics uh, students. If you're unfamiliar with this, uh, it looks kind of weird, but it provides opportunity when you go to a line and it changes color from black to blue. And then the next line is the same color as the end one. So it helps to keep um, readers synced up to one line to the next line. Um, and that goes across the board in order to be able to facilitate readers. This also helps uh, um, able students that just want to facilitate faster reading because it actually does work faster for some people. And I've seen students bounce back and forth when they come by uh, those things. So um, I kind of threw a whole bunch of accessibility things <laughs> on the way here. No, no, that's we, good. We take, Thank we you. take it very seriously. Uh, we're very aggressive in order, to, in order to address this because, you know, going back to the curation aspect, you know, we while we don't claim ownership of the content, we do take an investment in terms of making sure things are 100% up, up, up to date. And when someone has an issue, a student has an issue on a specific uh, aspect, we work with them in order to be able to address it. Because if one student has an issue on something, other students may have an issue in order to be able to address that. Now, as far as export, right now we have the PDF export. And PDF is really an atrocious format for for accessibility, okay? Uh, we are not even trying to make our PDF accessible. We are relying on, or we'll be relying on our EPUB as the uh, accessible export because it relies on the same HTML code that you see here that will just be manifested into a package and put it in. So that's meant to be our accessible export option uh, that's out there. Um, and uh, and such. So we have several other options for uh, dissemination that we, uh, we were interested in, so. Um, Thank you, Delmar. There are a few other That's things great. that we're also talking about, but uh, I will just leave it at that and just say we take it seriously. I think I can demonstrate we take it seriously. Um, and I actually have two accessibility people, uh, one on my campus, one off my campus with the students from disability centers that are moving forward. We, we are very serious in terms of uh, addressing these things. So. Oh, um, I didn't actually get a chance to show too much. Uh, any other questions or concerns? Uh, just really quick as, as a way to kind of wrap up. So um, my understanding is that faculty could create an account. Yes. And, and if go you go to. Um, yeah. But there's no cost for setting up an account. There's no cost for setting up an account uh, for 
there's no cost for it. Register.libretex. I'm pasting a URL here. So I pasted a URL in there, register.libretex.org. And that's what you, you use in order to, to request an account. Uh, and uh, we're going to be switching our account infrastructure in a few weeks to be an integrated infrastructure. So a single account will be used across multiple platforms on the Libreverse. Right now, they're separate, fragmented. Um, uh, but if you want access to adapt you can request it there and then we'll give you an adapt if you want access to a library so you can build the book again you have access to building up to five books per campus again it's part of our commitment to the community um, the adapt the conductor infrastructure uh, you can request an account at the you don't even have to request an account you can uh you can log into conductor and you can actually uh register without even talking to us so the actual building of the construction the building of your own projects and organizing them you have that free uh, even if you don't even if you decide to do a project that's not on the libra text platform like i said i'll cry but it's there for the community in order to be able to use um and it's again the only oer project management tool out there um, it's all open source, so if you want to grab it from GitHub, you can do that and run it on your own servers if you feel like it. So, um, all right, thank you, Delmar. And uh, I want you to know that I have been um, a big fan of this business model that you've created around this, and it's almost not even a business model. It's an, it's practically an anti-business model. And uh, I've seen a lot of these um, platforms come and go, and um, the one thing I like about having this as a foundation or a nonprofit uh, is that you don't feel like next week um, Microsoft is going to buy it up or something. So, anyway. <laughs> we can't. I mean, so the, the IRS basically means that the, the stuff that we create is still uh, owned by the community. Uh, so a, a private person can never buy what we are doing um, and such. Um, but that, that does you know play a strong role in terms of questions that's involved in there. Other platforms are for profit. Uh, many other platforms are for profit. Uh, and you have to start to ask about these sort of issues. And we've had that occasionally when, for example, Pressbooks ups their price or changes their pricing structure. Then we have a whole lot of people come to us and ask about how this actually all plays a role uh, or a, a wide range of other for profit uh, platforms that are trying to monetize students' use. And that goes back into we're trying to remove the exploitation of students or the exploitation of campuses that are uh, with the goals in order to address students. We take it very seriously. So thank you for your words. Okay. And uh, thank you again for coming in on a Saturday and uh, sharing with us. We really yeah, appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Um, I wish I were there. Uh, it's probably a little bit cooler up there than it is right here. Um, I think. <laughs> Uh, thank you again, and I hope the rest of the conference was quite uh, successful for you. Is this the last session? Uh, yeah, we have. We're going to do a, a breakout and discussion um, afterwards okay. about the whole two-day experience. Okay, was well, great. Up. Like I said, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and if anyone has any questions, feel feel free to contact me at delmar at libertex.org or request an account at uh, register.libertex.org. Um, and thank you again. And I will. Uh, Jeff, you, I'll send you directly the PowerPoint uh, file, right? That'd be great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sounds groovy. Okay. All right. Thank you. Take care, everyone.